Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. My name is Susan Derwin, and I'm the director of the IHC. For those of you who are new to the IHC, allow me to share with you our mission, which is to advance knowledge about human experience in cultural, historical, and social contexts, and to do so through programs that foster agency, social connectivity, and civic empowerment. Thank you all for coming today um, to this event, which is part of our year-long series, Imagining California. We've designed this series to explore the histories, stories, and innovations that created California, and to think together about the challenges and possibilities that lie in our state's future. I'm very excited that Susan Strait is here today to speak, to speak to us about her California stories. And before I introduce her, I would like to acknowledge the Chumash people, the, tr the traditional custodians of the land upon which the IHC is located, and I would like to pay respect to elders, past and present, as well as other indigenous people here today. Susan Strait is Distinguished Professor of Creative Writing at the University of California, Riverside, where she has taught since 1988. Her most recent novel, Mecca, was a finalist for the Kirkus Prize and named a Best Novel of the Year by the Washington Post and NPR, as well as a Top 10 California book by the New York Times. It was also the winner of the Southwest Book of the Year for Fiction. Her memoir, In the Country of Women, was long listed for the Carnegie Medal for Excellence, was a finalist for the Clara Johnson Prize for Women's Literature, and named a Best Book of 2019 by NPR, Code Switch, Real Simple, and others. Strait has published eight additional prize-winning and best-selling novels, including High Wire Moon, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, won the Commonwealth of California Gold Medal for Fiction, and was named one of the year's best novels by the San Francisco Chronicle and the Washington Post. Strait's essays and articles, which number in the hundreds, have appeared in publications such as The New Yorker, The New York Times, and Harper's, and her short fiction has appeared in numerous literary magazines. Her novels and stories have also been translated in at least eight languages. Are you keeping track? Eight, nine. Um, and in 2021, Strait was named Woman of the Year for the 61st Assembly District by Assemblyman Jose Medina for her 30 years of writing stories of African American, Mexican American, Asian American, and immigrant life in Southern California, and bringing little known histories, especially of women, into American books, museums, magazines, and libraries. A couple of years ago, an LA Times reporter described the wicker chair that sits on Susan Strait's front porch. It's a chair where people from her community come to sit and share their stories. The reporter wrote, and I quote, every day at Strait's house, friends and loved ones parade in and out. And the reporter also related how, as she and Strait toured the neighborhood, they stopped to chat with one acquaintance and then dropped off a cake at the home of another. I had Strait and her porch in mind when I was planning the Imagining California series. I knew I wanted to invite Strait to speak, not only because of the California subject matter of her work, but also because of the extraordinary sensibility her writing demonstrates. With this sensibility, Strait transforms the narrative she receives on her porch and beyond into literary works animated by a journalist's intuition for story, a musician's aptitude for cadence, and a lover's connection with the best and truest in the beloved. The story Susan Strait writes are love stories, born of a fierce, loyal, and discerning attachment to the people and places that make up her world. Please join me in welcoming Susan Strait to give her talk, Writing Our Californias. Thank you for that introduction. It made me feel a little bit better about the things I wrote because I was like, they're gonna think I'm crazy. Um, 
I, I drove up yesterday, and it's a beloved um, drive here and a beloved place because my uh, middle daughter lived here. She lived two years in Carpinteria, and then she lived in Santa Barbara for maybe more than maybe three years. I think she was here for five or six years total, and she worked uh, for Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And she and her husband got married at the courthouse in Santa Barbara, and uh, so it's a big deal. It, it's it, it was really sad actually being here without them last night. So it was good that it rained, and I just like walked around and thought about how we know almost every street at this point. You know, we've we've walked on every single street, and the Blue Owl is where they had their food um, from their reception for their reception. So. Anyway, I do love coming up here, but it's weird how kids wreck a place. Like, they've wrecked so many places for me. Uh, I go to this place, and I'm like, it's no fun without them. Just walking around, thinking about the past, being old. So I wore these pants because she found them in the closet recently, but I think it was a mistake. They're a little tight. Um, I was going to try to be sentimental about it, but it's just uncomfortable. I want to say thank you to Professor Susan Derwin and Chris Bob. I don't want to say your name. Boberg and the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center for inviting me because it does mean a great deal to me to talk to you about maybe our Californias, which I think are ever more distant in some ways from the rest of America. I mean, everyone just has this, they say this word in such a specific way now. So um, I love that this series imagines California through all these lenses and perspectives. And I'm coming to you today as a native daughter of Southern California. I'm someone whose first memories when I was three years old are of tumbleweeds blown by the Santa Ana winds so high around the little house where I was born that my mom couldn't open the door. And it was November. I remember so well the chain link fence near the freeway. So I was born in Glen Avon, which was an unincorporated community. And when I hang out, you know, people are like, where were you born? And I'm always like, Deciding, should I say Riverside? Should I say Rubido? Should I say Glen Avon? I have to think about it because it means something to be from a place like that. Uh, the chain link fence near our house was festooned that day with what looked like white snow. But it was November. We lived near a turkey ranch. Those were turkey feathers from the nearby farm. So I thought this beautiful, you know, snow-covered fence. And then, of course, the tumbleweeds were our equivalent of, like, Heidi and the snowdrifts in the Alps. I say that because my mother was born in the Swiss Alps, the land of Heidi. So she was used to snowdrifts blocking the door, and she was quite concerned about the tumbleweeds because you couldn't just shove through them. My mom, and we were just talking about our moms, my mom came to Fontana, California when she was 19. She never got to finish high school. She had been working in the fields in Canada. She had been sold off at 15 to a pig farmer, and she ran away. My stepmother had just been hired then in 1952 as head nurse for Kaiser Permanente, and that is the Kaiser Permanente steel mill. Kaiser Steel is the actual you know, beginning of, how many people in this room when someone says, what do you have, and you say, I have Kaiser? How many people? Just a few? Oh, in Riverside, it would be 99% of you. You'd be like, oh, you got a job? Did you get Kaiser? Oh, you're set. You're set. Because that's what it meant to live in the Inland Empire. Uh, my father, my natural father, was born in Fraser, Colorado, coldest town in America. He was also used to snowdrifts as well as poverty and violence. I'm telling you these things because I'm a first-generation Californian. My father's mother fled with him to Echo Park, where my father at nine watched Amy Semple McPherson, the famous evangelist, fly across a wire on the stage of her famous church, Angela's Temple, and then she lit herself on fire. He didn't like church. <laughs> when I was born in Glen Avon, um, I never knew that I was just across from the place where Mike Davis was born. And I wanted to bring up Mike Davis. Do you all remember anyone, the eminent writer and historian and social activist, Mike Davis? He passed away two years ago. Mike Davis was really famous. And when I first met him, he had read my work and I had read his work. He is the one who said, we are brother and sister, and we are separated only by this granite 
between Fontana and Glen Avon. And I was like, I can't, this man is super famous. He's world famous. He told me, this granite is so hard that you grew up playing in that it was quarried for the breakwaters of Long Beach and San Pedro in 1899. That these are particularly California stories. I'm forever seeing and writing about this state, my imagination and my thought process, so deeply ingrained, as you kindly said, in the landscape and narrative I've spent my whole life writing about. My nine novels, as well as my memoir, I realized when getting ready for this talk, they're all about how did people get here, who was already here, whose land was this, whose land is this, and what do people bring with them from their homelands, and how do they add that to the landscape? So now, and I'm not just going to lecture at you because that's boring. How many of you are students? Raise them high. OK, you got some students here. And how many are faculty? All right. And how many are people from the community? This is amazing, right? I like it. So are you guys ready to answer some questions? You're like, wait, you're getting paid to talk. Why are we talking? I'm from Riverside. You know how it is. We're always trying to find out about you. All right, so let's ask some questions. How many people in this room were born in California? Look around. There's a lot of people, right? So is it true that no one was born in California? Everyone came here from somewhere else? Really, though? How many people in this room are the first in your family to go to college? All right. Let's go one step deeper. How many people in this room are the first in your family to graduate from high school? Really? I'm the only one? Because at UCR, where I teach, if I'm standing in front of 400 students, maybe more than 70% of us raise our hands. And it's an absolute shock to my students because I look like this. I mean, I got my hair done. I get it done once a year. I got it done for you guys. My friend Tracy's like, it's not July. Why are you here? I said, I have to go to Santa Barbara. She's like, oh, <laughs> let me make you look good then. I look as blonde and whatever as possible. But I am the first person in my family to graduate from high school. My mom never got to graduate in Canada after they got there from Switzerland. And my dad, who I just described to you, was beaten by his father with an air filter in Ontario at 15 and left homeless when he was abandoned by both his parents. He lived in the kitchen of the first foster freeze on Route 66, the famous Route 66. These couldn't be more California stories, could they? And yet, the reason I say this to you is that when I ask these questions around the country, people are shocked. They're like, but you're a distinguished professor and you're a famous writer. And I'm like, and I still am the first person in my family to graduate from high school. As I have to say, many people on my block still haven't graduated from high school. And they're working. Um, so I bring this up because after those tumbleweeds that I described to you, my real dad left for another woman. My mom was eight months pregnant with my little brother. I was three. And my mom still wasn't a citizen. How many people in this room have parents who weren't citizens when they were born? A few people. My mom became a citizen solely to vote for John F. Kennedy, who she thought was the most handsome man in the world. That's the reason. I, I mean, I'm sure she would have done it eventually, but she really wanted to vote for JFK. When she was in citizen class in Riverside, she met my stepfather, who was from Canada, also a land of snow. She learned to speak English from listening to Vin Scully do Dodger broadcasts on her little transistor radio. And that, my friends, is as California as it gets. When Vin Scully retired, um, the LA Times did a piece about the hundreds if not thousands of people who said that their parents had learned to speak English from listening to Dodger broadcasts. We have historians here. We have future historians. We have writers here. How many people are writers? A few, all right. We have lovers of literature, philosophers, linguists. So to describe to you how to write narratives of imagination and lands landscape, I thought if it would interest you to talk about a little bit of the difference between memoir and fiction. Would that be interesting? as well, because it is different. You can't just say, oh, I learned all this history. How will I write about it? So I thought I'd read you two little passages from this book. This is the memoir. I will never write another memoir. It was so hard. I like fiction. You just make things up. As my mom says, it's the only job where you can just tell lies and you don't have to dress well. <laughs> it's true. 
She worked in a bank. She's like, we would never let you dress like that at the bank. Also, you're not wearing pantyhose. And I'm like, I, I know. What I told you was what I remember seeing. But when we're writing, we're changing it already, aren't we? Like, you're already changing the narrative, which is why, as Joan Didion said, you can't ever trust a writer. Here in the land of tumbleweeds, so immensely and fiercely mobile, in Glen Avon, California, in 1963, a windstorm in November sent so many skeletal balls of thorn blowing across the fields that the small house where my mother and I lived was buried in brown. It was a valley of granite boulders and turkey ranches, tumbleweeds six and eight feet across, packed in drifts around the windows, which were coated with dust from the famous Santa Ana winds. It was like a snowstorm, my mother told me years later, and I couldn't even open the door. Back in 1965, after my mother had been left, my stepfather, who was from Canada, bought the laundromat next to the market where my mother, in that November day, had spent her last quarter on my first book because all I wanted to do was read. For the next 10 years, there were five of us, and I was the oldest. We kids swept the floors of clouds of lint, restocked the little boxes of detergent, and I watched people move about. In our community, Glen Avon, Rubido, Pedley, Miraloma, everyone was descendants of slaves, Okies, Braceros, and Japanese strawberry farmers. These were the parents of my friends at school. We drank in vacant lots, my friends and me, strawberry wine in lily tulip cups near the lily tulip plant with the actual giant concrete cup. It's the world's largest paper cup because it's concrete. Then we married each other, and our children are American babies, and I wrote this very particularly, despite what some people think. A few times a year now, I walk past the old lily tulip cup where we used to party. I'm 63. My friends party in different places now like the Elks Lodge, I confess to Susan. The towering cement is painted white and blue. This cup is near the last of the orange groves. As a child in the laundromat, I must have known that my life would be about language and place because I saw people's baskets full of stories, the way their hands moved when they held up a shirt, the way their eyes narrowed with private legends of the man or the baby or the mother to whom it belonged. Every night still, I walk along the Santa Ana River with my dog and up into the steep, small foothills along the riverbed. From the rocky slopes, I can see my whole life. I have made no great odysseys. I live three blocks from the hospital where I was born, which my kids find very pathetic. They're like, don't look out the back window, Mom. You'll see the hospital. And it'll make you sad that you've never gone anywhere. I'm not sad, though. I am a woman who left briefly, and I came back right away and I've never left home since. Looking west, I can see Mission Boulevard, the street, then I'm up on Mount Rubido, this, which is a little, it's not even a mountain. It's Riverside, we call it a mountain. It's not actually a mountain. Anyway, I'm up on that mountain, and when I look west, I can see Mission Boulevard, which is literally the street that leads to the house where I was born, and I can see the laundromat in a small place called Rubido. That place, was rancho land taken from the Cahuilla peoples by Spanish Californios and sold to Lois Robido, a French-born fur trapper who left St. Louis and ended up marrying a young Spanish woman, and that's how he got his land. My ex-husband's cousins still live in the near the river in a family compound built by a man we know as Gato Henderson Butts in the 1920s, after he left Oklahoma. If I look north, I can see the Cajon Pass, which everyone in our family navigated when they came to California, no matter where they came from, no matter what race. My grandmother, Ruby, and my father, when he was seven, came down that pass onto Route 66 on a bus. San Bernardino, Ontario, Echo Park. My ex-husband's great-grandmother, Fine, born to an enslaved woman just after the Civil War, sent all her grandchildren across that same desert and down the same pass into Los Angeles and San Bernardino. If I turn east, I see my childhood neighborhood and my ex-husband's. Maybe I know a 1,000 people still in that neighborhood. And if I turn the last quarter, looking south only half a mile, I can see my own house. I've lived there for 35 years. I've raised three daughters. 
In historical photos, acres of citrus and walnut groves covered that land for miles, and my house and the house across the street were the only two. My bungalow has green shingles and burgundy window frames. It was built in 1910. It was once solitary in the tree. Now it anchors the corner of a block where, again, I know another thousand people. My eldest daughter's friends, once I said I would paint the house blue, cried because they said they wouldn't be able to find their way to the place where they could always be sure of food, many snacks, a couch on which to sleep, and the perfect book to take with them in the morning. Because my house, in the middle of what many people in California think is a bad neighborhood, I made into a home from Robert Frost's poem. When you go there, does anybody know the end? They have to take you in. And that's what home meant. So I wanted to read you that little part, because really we're, writing, we're talking about imagining landscapes. And now, again, it's your turn. There are famous California writers, true? I read their books from childhood, from the Riverside Public Library. Let's hear some of your favorites. I want to know, because people always bring up certain iconic writers. And don't be like, well, we didn't bring you up. It's not like that. I'm literally wearing earrings that cost $2. I'm not trying to get compliments. Some of your favorite, favorite California writers? John Steinbeck. Others? Come on. Robert Haas. Robert Haas, excellent, great poet. Anyone else? Come on, you guys. I knew you were going to bring up Diddy, and I was waiting for it so I could do the rest of my talk. I was like, darn it, everyone always brings up John Diddy, and this audience is like, no, we're not going to help you. Um, of course, those are the two writers that everyone brings up, right? But there are also some great writers that I think are underappreciated that helped me because they wrote about their places. I, I put, you know, John Steinbeck, of course, I read everything he wrote. I just reread, um, because I had to, East of Eden. Like, I was just like, oh, I'm just going to read some East of Eden. I'm just going to think about that little beautiful creek that goes underneath the willow trees. When I was in college at the USC library, I found Shirley Ann Williams. She wrote about Fresno. Gary Soto also wrote about Fresno. I found Leonard Gardner's Stockton in Fat City, Ella Leflin's San Francisco, and Al Young's San Francisco. And for LA, really, how can you not love Carolyn C? I mean, Carolyn C is the classic. And she was, she was born in, in LA. One of my favorite we were really good friends. She was like my literary godmother. Um, I gave a eulogy for her. One of my favorite lines that she ever wrote, because her mom was so mean, and my little mom was so mean when, when we were small. When she was tough, she was 4'11". Carolyn C. died. She passed away, yes. Um, one of my favorite lines from her memoir is that Carolyn C. was born with a large port wine stain, a birthmark. But she was also, she hated her mom, and she was really smart, and she was a woman, and she wasn't supposed to be smart. So she said, I would look at my mom with this utter condescension. Her mom would slap her and say, get that look off your face. And Carolyn would be like, if only I could. Um, and she said, my mother would slap me by the Cecile Bruner roses in the gravel driveway. And I remember thinking, that is so LA, right? That's a beautiful line, because you see you have the emotion, you have the family narrative, and you have the landscape, all in one sentence. Isn't that gorgeous? Uh, two other writers, Wanda Coleman. Everyone's making this huge deal. The LA Times keeps writing about Wanda Coleman, and I'm like, you should have bought her books when she was broke, okay? Because it's really hard to be famous when you're not here anymore. Wanda Coleman, essential poet of African-American Los Angeles. And the other writer I wanted to throw out for you guys is John Retchie. First iconic gay writer, City of Night, is really about a young man who is Chicano arriving in Los Angeles in the 50s and 60s. Um, everyone reads John Fonte, Ask the Dusk, but I think John Retchie is also amazing. So I do all this so I can tell you about Joan Didion. I really became a writer. We're not, we're not being shocked in here if I tell you any more bad things. I've already told you like 12 bad things. True? I became a writer when I was 15. I took a summer school class at Riverside City College. Now, I've written about this for the LA Times, so it's common knowledge that my dad caught me with a can of Olympia beer, maybe two cans, in my jeans jacket, which I shouldn't have put on because it was June, 
why was I wearing a jacket? It was already like 99. But I was not going to drink them. I think beer is disgusting. But I was taking them to the park for a friend. And uh, my friends were all doing really bad things when I was 15. Um, my girlfriends. My three girlfriends out till 2 in the morning already distributing pharmaceuticals. I, though, had an immigrant mom. So I was grounded for three months. It seems like a long time, doesn't it? She also said I had to take summer school. So I took a class um, called creative writing. I was 15. You could go to City College when you were 15. Like, no one cared. I wrote my very first short stories. My very first short story was set in the desert. It had horned toads, a gila monster. Do you know what a gila monster is? It's a giant lizard, and it has, like, orange-looking beads, and it will clamp onto your arm or leg and then never let go. That's the legend. So I put that in the book. I mean, the story. I had jumping cholla cactus. Have you ever been attacked by a jumping cholla? You walk past it and it leaps onto your ankle and then your dad has to pull it out with pliers. You'll have to trust me. I have a character in that story that I wrote when I was 15 who travels up a creek bed to an oasis where she finds a dead body. My second story was set in the San Jacinto Mountains. Mossy boulders, another creek, waterfall at the end, and what does the character find? Another dead body. So the professor called me in and said, would you like to talk about anything? And I'm like what? And he was like, is everything okay at home? And I'm like, no, I mean, it's awful. I'm the oldest of five people. I have to cook every night. I don't have a car. I took the bus here. Someone tried to assault me. And he was like, I meant the dead bodies. And I was like, oh, well, if you're going to write fiction, you have to have dead bodies, right? Like, that's a thing. And he was like, no, people can live. They could have a conversation. They could come to some realization about something. And I'm like, for reals, though? (laughs) Like, that's possible? And he said, what have you been reading? And I said, well, there are only books in my house are Reader's Digest condensed books, which my parents bought because they had the gold, you know, at the edge. Those of you who are young are like, what is she talking about? How many of you guys know these books? Yes, you're like, it's an old people thing. Well, when you were poor and someone tried to sell you books, they sold you things that had gold on the edge of the pages because it looked good. Um, But all those books featured a murder, and so I thought there had to be a murder. At 17, though, I read about another dead body. And this is where you guys are like, when are you going to get to Joan Didion? I'm trying. I read about another dead body, and it was Joan Didion who wrote about that dead body. Her most famous essay, maybe not her most famous, but one of the most famous, oops, i got to find it, is called... Some Dreamers of the Golden Dream, okay? It is taught, how many of you guys have read this essay in class or somewhere else? A lot of people, right? It really is the most famous one. So I'm 17, my parents dropped me off in a pickup truck at USC, I have a full ride because there's five kids and my dad made $12,000 at the laundromat. I am not beautiful, I've never gone anywhere, but I knew I was a writer. And there I was, 17. Our first assignment was a Xerox copy of Joan Didion's essay, Some Dreamers of the Golden Dream. I read it three times. I mean, it left me breathless because her sentences were lapidary, like they were jewels of precision. And in that precision, she dissected the place where I was born with such lovely caustic prose that she made me feel terrible. Quote, this is the country where it is easy to dial a devotion but hard to buy a book. This is the country in which a belief in the literal interpretation of Genesis has slipped imperceptibly into a belief in the literal interpretation of double indemnity, which would be about having affairs. The country of teased hair and caprice and the girls for whom all of life's promise comes down to a waltz-length white wedding dress and the birth of a Kimberly or a Sherry or a Debbie and a Tijuana divorce and a return to hairdresser school. I was stunned because... My mom had clearly been married twice. Um, All three of my aunts were divorcees. My aunt was married three times. My dad was on his fourth marriage, my real dad. Um, One aunt had been married three times, including to one of the original Hell's Angels. I'm glad they got divorced. But my friends, black, white, Japanese-American, and Mexican-American, were named Kimberly, Sherry, and Debbie. In fact, there was Debbie Harper, Debbie Martinez, and Debbie Matsumoto. So I was like, I would like to write about my place. And that was it. I think when I was 17, I wasn't writing because I hated Joan Didion, but I was writing in answer to Joan Didion. And the reason I bring this up is because we're talking about imagining 
our homeland of California, right? And right now, don't you feel like it's the same thing? People are like, oh my God, you're from California. This is in New York. That's so nice. I don't know how you get anything done there. And I'm like, in my head, I've written 10 books. I got three kids. I take care of my mom at night. I just couldn't get anything done. I mean, we read so much in New York. And I'm like, do you? And I say, for those of you who are young, this is what you say, imagine. Because that's what older ladies say when they're like, you idiot. So I'm like, imagine. What do you read? And they're like, oh, we read serious stuff. And they're like, the thing about California is the sun's always out. So I just, I know it must be much harder for you guys to work. And I'm like, I know, it comes out every day. So I think it's like a, a planetary thing. You know, like the sun comes up and then it goes down. Sometimes it's 120 degrees. I don't know how we get anything done either, but we do. We get so much done. It's true. Am I lying to you? No. They're like, oh, so you like it there. And I'm like, oh, I do. I really do. And they're like, where do you live? And I say, I live in Riverside. And they're like, oh, oh, my God. Isn't that where? And I'm like, they invented methamphetamine? Yes. <laughs> they're like, isn't that? And I'm like, where the first orange tree was ever planted? That, is, is that you have an orange there at the store? Yes. And they're like, how long have you lived in Riverside? And I said, since my parents had sex. I will die there, and they will bury me on, like, Mount Rubidoux, and I'll keep an eye on everyone. So nice to meet you. And then I move on. So what I'm going to say to you is, let's take a tour of the Golden State with me, okay? If I walk down the Santa Ana River Trail for a mile with my dog, which I do quite frequently, about two miles, maybe, the Anza Crossing marker is in a parking lot just above the Santa Ana River. It's near a railroad bridge that's covered with graffiti. The Juan Batista de Anza party, coming north from Mexico, took weeks to cross the desert. The first white Californian, which is funny because it was like a Spanish soldier and his wife's kid, so people now would be like, was born in the San Jacinto Mountains. But the party had to spend the night in what's now Riverside, Spanish soldiers and the indigenous men from Mexico who were guiding them, they built rafts for the cattle, horses, carts, and humans to cross in 1774. So people are like, there's no history in California. I mean, like, it's not like Boston. And I'm like, <laughs> that's so funny. The reason I'm telling you this is because that's an easy narrative to write, isn't it? Because that can be on a plaque. But you know when I really got to know Anza Crossing? My brother-in-law, I have four brothers-in-law, but my brother-in-law, Derek, 6'8", weighs 385 pounds. He used to be a firefighter. He worked night security at Anza Crossing for two years. I used to bring him food and, like, chill out with him. At midnight, the coyotes would come running up the bank and attack his truck. They would just thump his truck until he finished his lunch because they could smell his dinner through the closed windows. An owl used to drop rabbit heads on the truck because didn't like him sitting there. Homeless people living in the riverbank would build cooking fires and they would come by and visit with him. So what I'd like us to do is imagine the layers of history. There's this history and there's right now. And if you're like, what was he guarding at the Anza Crossing? <laughs> Might be the best part. Somebody had stolen a crane from the county. They were like doing a big excavation project. He was like, yeah, somebody stole a crane. So I got hired. And I'm like, who buys a crane? He's like, that's what I was wondering. Like, you just show up and you're like, dude, dude I got a crane. Do, do you want to buy it? <laughs> He's like, who does that? And I'm like, that's... He said, anyway, I have to guard the crane and the water buffalo and all the trucks. It was fun. I learned a lot more about the Anza Crossing because my brother-in-law used to have to read it to tourists who stopped by just before his shift started. And while we're imagining California... I think we are imagining it in different ways from the cliches we're given, right? So, okay, it's your turn again, although y'all didn't give me Didion for a minute. What are the cliches about us? I mean, I look like the most cliched person possible. Again, I did not choose these pants. And these earrings, I bought them from my neighbor who went to high school two years before me, and her sister was dying of cancer, and she made all these earrings and sold them in the front yard for $2. So, I am not a cliche. 
even though I have hair that looks like this. This is how my hair has looked since I was 12. As Tracy often says, do you want to change it up? Because you've looked like this since you were 12. I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> you tell me some cliches about us, about California. What do you hear? Yeah, we're all surfers. I love that one because when I went to graduate school, I was lucky enough to study with James Baldwin, who was the only person kind to me. I was already married to my giant husband who used to look like Magic Johnson, now looks like Shaquille O'Neal. I did a lot of cooking. Um, we got there and everyone's like, oh, you're from LA. Are you gonna write about surfing? I'm like, I'm from Riverside, we don't have water. Just, we're not allowed to, it's just, it's a thing. And then they're like, what are you gonna write about then? Hollywood? And I'm like, yeah, that's, I've never been there. Others? We all have swimming pools. I actually have the little turtle, you know, like it's a turtle, it's plastic, and then you put the top on it, it's our swimming pool. The girls are like, we grew up with a swimming pool. And now the dog sits in it. <laughs> All right. Any others? Cliches? Come on, you guys, help me out. I guess she is. <laughs> yeah, I'm fully aware that I look like bad Barbie. Oh, yes, Valley speak, which is funny um, because in my neighborhood, again, if you don't speak half in Spanish, you're really suspect, suspect, so no one's using like. Um, lots of bad words. Other cliches? Come on, you guys have to help me out. What? Thank you, gosh, I was waiting so long. You're a tough audience. I'm gonna come back to the freeways. You're all Oprah's neighbor. That's so nice. Does she keep extra eggs just in one case you wanna borrow some? You should have seen on the way up, because I was terrified that it was going to rain, and my daughters were all like, I can't believe you're going to go up there. What if you can't make it back down? And then you need to be doing this, and who's going to take care of Grandma? And then you have to watch Nancy and Mario's son, Moises, and what? And I'm like, well, if I get to the flooded part, I can stay with two people. And they're like, yeah, Meghan Markle or Oprah, right? You're just going to knock on the door. I'm like, oh, I was going to stay with Patsy. <laughs> but anyway, let's go back to the freeways. All right, who's from Southern California? Anybody? All right, the freeway thing. What is the most egregious thing that makes fun of our freeways? Which I never even knew about till two years ago when my children showed it to me. It's on Saturday Night Live. The Californians? Okay, everyone makes fun of it. So, good test. Again, I don't mind doing this at all. I wrote an essay about how many times this giant ex-husband and I have had to rent a truck and move one of our kids, okay? So we have moved the middle kid, the one that used to work here, who's 32, we have moved her from Riverside to Santa Barbara. Then she came back and put all her stuff in my garage. That's how I found these pants. She then went from Riverside to Berkeley. So he was like, she was married. She was like, he was like, I guess we gotta take her stuff up there. So I'm thinking we're gonna take the 60 to the 15 to the 10 to the 57 and then we're gonna get up on the 210, and then we're gonna take the five, and he goes, but when we get up there, you know what up there means, right? She was going to Berkeley. Yeah, he hates it. It's, it's a deep, passionate NorCal hatred. It's so deep. Don't make me get started, it's so deep. He's like, when we get up there, then you have to tell me the freeways, because I don't know them. It's like, because it's all that, it's the 80s, and I don't be doing the 80s, and I'm like, you mean when we gotta take the 280 to the 580 to the 680 to the 880? He's like, don't, don't, don't even bring it up. And he gets very upset when we make that left turn at Tracy. And he's like, well, excuse my language, now the shit's gonna start. He's like, don't even tell me until we get close. And then he's like, are we close? When do the 80s start? And it's like, it's vicious, he's so angry. On the way back, he's very happy because he's back to that's how we get there, all right? But that's how you get to Pasadena, true? I have to take six freeways. My youngest daughter lives in South Pasadena. So I love telling that story. I love looking like this and being like, oh, I had to go see my daughter in Pasadena. So I took the, and then I list the same thing, only I get on the 134 for a minute and then I get on the 110 for like five minutes. But I like saying the 110 because it sends anyone from New York over the edge. They're like, there is no way that you had to go 38 miles and you took that many freeways. I'm like, I know. I don't know how people live here. I just don't know. It's just awful. And then after we deliver all the furniture to Pasadena, we have to go to Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles. Oh. 
I don't know what to say. They're like, what is that? And I'm like, never mind. All right, so those are some cliches. I'm very glad you brought them up because uh, next on our tour, are we okay with time? Okay. Next on our tour, I can't see that. We're good. Okay. I want to talk to you about Coachella Valley. All right. What is the Coachella Valley famous for? It's the music festival, right? Okay. So I want to say that my last novel, but really since I was five, because my parents were so cold for their whole lives, they, A, never wanted to see snow. We were like, can we go see snow? And they're like, no. We've seen it. And they're like, we were like, can we go up to like Big Bear? And they're like, no, there's a lot of traffic. Everyone wants to see the snow. It's just snow. You don't need to see it. We're like, okay. My dad, though, my stepdad, big traveler, and they always wanted to go to the desert. So we are got a small travel trailer. Uh, we're, it's pulled by a 1966 Country Squire station wagon. Five kids. I'm the oldest. So we get one box of Cracker Jacks in the back, and I have to, like, parcel them out evenly, and no one wants the peanuts. Uh, we went to Coachella all the time. And this was before Coachella was Coachella, right? We would go because my mom and dad wanted to be absolutely in the 120 degree heat in the summer. They thought that was the best thing ever. And what that meant was when I was five or six was the first time I ever saw a date palm grove, all right? Has anyone ever been inside a date palm grove? It is truly one of the worst places in the world to work and one of the most beautiful places in the world. And that juxtaposition is what I want to say to you, is that when you're standing there, it is like a cathedral. And I've been obsessed with it, and I've been trying to write about it. The date palms stretch for miles. The Salton Sea is at the end. It's 120 degrees. There are ladders nailed to the trees. It is where 90% of the world's dates are grown, even now, still. All the dates for Ramadan are often from the Coachella Valley. They're mailed. Um, I think what fascinates me about it is, again, that it's a hidden kingdom, right? So I decided I was going to go out there and do some stories. And I was working with a photographer named Doug McCullough, Douglas McCullough, who has great Santa Barbara roots. And um, we were writing for KCET, um, the television station in Los Angeles, but we were writing for their website. We wrote for them for two and a half years. I think I must have written about 55 pieces. It was a lot of fun. I would pick Doug up in my car, and he'd say, where are we going? And I'm like, don't worry about it. And I, he's like, you're just going to, and I'm like, yep. And so we went to Coachella, and I thought I'd tell you about that part. Um, we went to the Empire Polo Grounds, and we went in February. Does anybody remember when Coachella, the music festival, starts? It's in April. But the people who work Coachella, they start in February. We talk to everybody. So all the, fence, all the fences, they come from San Bernardino, all right? So here's like six Chicano guys and two Mexican-born guys, giant trucks. They're putting up miles of chain link fence because there's all these like ways they have to direct people right and I was like where's all the fencing from I was like where are you guys from they're like where are you from I'm like I'm from Riverside and they're like where were you born I was like Rubidoux and they're like oh okay tell you anything they're like we're from San Bernardino we have to drive all the way out here every day we're putting up all this fencing and then we got to drive home the porta potties Ontario the horse groomers all from Mexico, because that is the Empire Polo Grounds. And then I met three women from Coachella that day. They walked the entire lawn, because there had been like a little event, picking up every cigarette butt, every cup, and every piece of trash. And I said, where do you guys live? And they said, we live four blocks away from here. I said, how much are you making? And they said, nothing. All right? It was 100. It was already 100. Then we met men who quarried rock from the Whitewater area that have to even out the field. All of that is for Coachella, true? Huge amounts of money. Um, if you're asking me, how do I learn all this stuff? I have this face, I look really dumb, all right? So I'm like, oh my God, where does the fencing come from? And everyone's like, oh, and then they tell me everything. And you know why I'm a good writer? Because I'm a good listener. Not because I'm smart, not because I can write well. It's because I listen. I have this face and you can tell me anything and I will listen to you, and I will remember it all, and I will write it down later. It drives my kids crazy. They're like, she never forgets anything. They'll call me, and they'll be like, so how many rebounds? And I'm like, 12. They're like, how did you? I'm like, yeah, I knew what you were going to ask me. All right, after that, we left Coachella, 
the festival, and we drove down the presidential streets. Has anyone ever known? All the streets in the Coachella Valley are named after presidents. There's only one street that's really little. It's a dirt road. All the other ones are huge. Harrison, um, I'm blinking. I mean, they're either named for that or like Frank Sinatra. All right, but Harrison, all the big streets, Polk. There's a tiny little street in the middle of Coachella in the Empire Date Festival. I'm sorry, in the Empire Polo Grounds. Clinton Road, it's a dirt road. I think you can tell how, uh, how they felt about him. It is a tiny dirt road that goes where the horses are. Um, after we left the Polo Grounds, we drove to the Torres Martinez Reservation. And I've been there several times because my marriage family, um, the woman I mentioned named Fine, her daughter Daisy, arrived in 1936 with four daughters to Calexico. So my marriage family, their first place that they lived in 1936 was Calexico. So that whole narrative that people are like, well, when did, when did African Americans, oh, they only really started coming after the war. People in Riverside have been there since 1870, 1880, 1920s, and my mother-in-law arrived as a baby with no birth certificate in 1936. So um, several people in that family in Calexico, they had a hay ranch, married people from the Torres Martinez Reservation. So we went there. Doug and I saw two men sitting at a picnic table, and I was like, hey, what's up? It's February, and they're like, yeah. And they said, so do you ever drive anybody around for Coachella? And they're like, oh my God, mija. They'll tip you $200, but they'll be naked. And I'm like, really? And I'm like, why are they naked? And they're like, because they're so high, they took all their clothes off. And then they have me drive around because they're hot and they want ice. And then I drive them here, and then I drive them back to their Airbnb, and then they give me $200. And I'm like, this is an interesting turn of events. And they're like, that's how April is. And I'm like, okay. And he said, I made $1,000 in one week in April. And I said, so what do you do now? And they drive people from the Coachella Valley who have no vehicles to the free clinic on the Torres Martinez Reservation. I wanted to tell you this, because we're almost out of time, and I wanted to tell you that this is what narrative means. And this is what a hidden kingdom means, right? So I'm sitting there with these two guys. One was 40, one was 35, and we were just chilling. We looked across to the Santa Rosa Mountains. So now when I'm on my little mountain, Mount Rubido, I can see Mount Baldy, which is San Antonio. I can see the San Gorgonios. I can see San Jacinto. That's how lucky I am. Right now, when it's been snowing, I can see three different mountain ranges covered with snow. So when people are like, oh my God, Riverside, there's not much to see. I'm like, no, <laughs> not much at all. When you drive to Coachella, you're at the Santa Rosa Range, and it's beautiful. The mountains are like crenellated. Do you know that word? It's as if they're folded in on each other, and they're purple all the time. But right before the sun goes down, they're this amazing pink, gold, purple. It's the most beautiful thing. And you're surrounded by the, the palm trees as well. So we were sitting there at the picnic table. Doug was taking pictures. And um, across from us were the fish traps. Now, the fish traps are above the Salton Sea. And everyone makes fun of the Salton Sea right now, OK? It smells pretty bad. It's true. Right now, and I added this last night, huge lithium mining started two weeks ago at the Salton Sea. It's going to be giant. It's going to ruin massive amounts of the landscape. But what do we need lithium for? Where are we getting, it? Where are we getting lithium from right now? Chinese people, maybe. But most of it is coming from underserved communities in Africa. Sometimes people are trying to find it in Brazil. They found it at the Salton Sea. So we're looking. This was, I did this story in 20, 2018. The fish traps, you can see them. They're stones. They're walls, little stone circles. And they're built all along the sides because that was Lake Kawea, not the Salton Sea. It was an ancient lake. And when the water level rose, after the rain, the fish would be trapped inside. And the Kawea people at Torres Martinez, as well as other places, would easily go out and get fish. So imagine how old those things are. And they're still there. You can see them. And then the guy started talking to me, and he told me a great story, which is kind of what I wanted to end with. He said, you know what? I remember when I was little, my great uncles, they used to ride to the fiestas in Palm Springs on their horses, like back in the 1950s. He said they would ride straight across from here, Torres Martinez, 
to the mountains. And then they would turn right. And he said, then they would just, the horses would just go, and they would get to Palm Springs, and they would party with the Agua Caliente people. I was actually on the phone this morning with a DJ who works for the Art Lobo Connection, and her first job was at the Agua Caliente um, Casino. Back then, there was no casino, but they had big fiestas. So he was like, yeah, they would stay there like two days, they would meet some women, they would party, they would drink, they would eat, and then when they were tired, they would get back on the horses, and they could fall asleep, and the horses would just walk by the mountain, and then they would turn left, and then they would come home. And I was like, that is actually a great story. And they're like, yeah, they had good times back then. I wanted to say, if you are willing to spend a couple hours just chilling and listening, that's what you get. But here's the end. And the end I can say to you is what I was thinking of late last night when I was working on this. For me, it's all about, when I'm in the Santa Ana River, it's all about the acorns. It's all about the oak trees and the cottonwoods and the sycamores, because those are our native trees, right? From the time I was little, I knew those were the trees. And I knew people from Morongo, people from uh, San Manuel, we all went to school together. And I knew, like, acorns, that's what people ate. And my mom was down for it, because she was like, it seems like free food. So I made my younger siblings collect acorns in a basket. I dried them in the oven. I shelled them. Uh, I made my brothers grind them up with rocks from the foothills. I soaked them twice in water to remove the bitterness, which that's what I read. I boiled them in a pot, and I made my younger siblings eat acorn mush with me, and they kind of freaked out. So I put some brown sugar and a little milk, and we ate it. To me, the oak tree. Last night, I was sitting at the hotel out there waiting for the rain, and the oak tree that's there at the hotel is huge. And those branches that lie on the ground, right, those are in Central California. They're in NorCal, aren't they? Because I know my ex-husband, he's always like, fine, at least we get to see some trees before we get to the 80s. Because when you turn left at Tracy, you're going to see the beautiful oak trees. When you turn on the 152 to go to um, Pajaro, you're going to see them. When you leave Riverside and you go down to Temecula, you're going to see oak trees. So I wanted to end with this. This is one more story. I think the thing that helps me write, especially because my life is still absolutely chaotic and I take care of so many people, is that right at dusk, no matter what, unless I'm really sick, I take my dog and I walk along the Santa Ana River. I never, ever, ever get tired of it because it's my homeland. And there are oak trees, there are willows, that's what people used to make aspirin from, there are the sycamores, and there are the cottonwoods. But last summer, late summer, I took a walk a little later than I usually do. It was probably August, maybe September, and I was late, and I've been late before, and I get surrounded by coyotes, and it's me and my dog, and then I have to call somebody, and just so that in case we get attacked, they'll, I'll be on the phone, and I have to run. Sometimes I'm wearing my work clothes, and I have to like run for a mile, which is why I just wear boots to work now. But this time, we decided to walk a different way. We were way far from home, maybe a mile and a half, we were halfway to the Anza Crossing that I started this with. So I thought it would work for you. There was a guy following me. He decided to follow me, so I left the asphalt trail and I went down the dirt trail, but he knew the dirt trail too, so I'm like, ay, ay, ay. So he's following me. He's insane looking. He's younger than me. He's been following me for a little while, and I'm like, oh. So I'm on the phone with my daughter, the youngest one who lives in Pasadena. And she's like, I told you not to walk so late. What are you doing so late? She was, is it a coyote? I'm like, no, it's a guy. And she's like, oh, my God, Mom. And then I was like, oh, no. In front of me was a mountain lion, a juvenile mountain lion. And you guys are like, no, that's not true. Oh, but my friends that are in the homeless encampment that, like, we went to high school together, they're like, yeah, there's been a mountain lion down here. He's there, and we've seen him there and there. And I'm like, great. It was a juvenile mountain lion. It was pretty small. My dog is from the pound. She's a flat-coated retriever. She weighs 62 pounds. She's a black, shaggy dog. You know, she's pretty tall. We've seen a bobcat before. She and the bobcat were the same size, and she was like, and the bobcat was like, and then they both went. <laughs> like, I didn't see you, and you didn't see me, and no one has to say nothing about nothing. And I was like, I like this. This is our usual plan. This, though, was a cat, and it crossed from this huge area of brush and there's been some brush clearance and so I thought okay so it came down and it stopped and I was here and the guy was here so my daughter's like who are you more scared of the mountain lion or the homeless guy and I was like definitely the homeless guy and she was like okay 
She's like, the mountain lion doesn't want you. You're not attractive, and no one wants to eat you. And Angel's too big. It wants rabbits. And I'm like, really? You're the expert now? You're 28. She's like, just keep walking. So I kept walking. The mountain lion crossed in front of us, stopped, looked at me, looked at Angel, and I was like, I don't know what to do. I mean, I can yell for coyotes, although it hurts, but I'm not trying to yell for a mountain lion. It literally did that. It was like, whatever, and kept walking that way. So we are now walking like this. I'm looking at it, and it headed into a stand of oak trees. And I was like, okay, good, okay, good. And I went this way, and then I started to run. When I got maybe another half a mile, another guy came out with a girlfriend from behind a bush. He's like, why are you running? Why are you out of breath? Why are you running? And I had my Dodgers cap on. He's like, are you from here? And I'm like, I am from here. Why would I be running if I'm not from here? And he's like, what did you see? I said, I saw a mountain lion. And he's like, oh, that mountain lion? And I was like, what is happening? He's like, yeah, we saw him once. He took off his belt. He had baggy pants. He took off his belt. He wrapped it around his hand with the buckle, like, loose. And he waved his hand in the air. He's like, okay, fine, I'm ready. He's like, he always comes up to where we're sleeping. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> you have a belt around your wrist. And he was like, we'll be fine. I said, okay. His girlfriend was super high, probably fentanyl. And they had stashed their belongings behind this huge little stand of wild tobacco. And you guys know wild tobacco, right? With the little tubes like macaroni. So I said, good to meet you. And he says, good to meet you too. He goes, be safe out there. And I said, you too. And then they went that way. They retrieved their belongings. And they walked down the trail. And I went that way. And I went home. And I thought about California. That's what I wanted to say. Thanks. To write about that and send it off to the New Yorker or send it off to the New York Times or the LA Times, or this is my latest book, which has a lot of Coachella in it. I mean, Mecca is a city in the Coachella Valley. So having gone around the country with this book, and people are like, why is it called Mecca? Is it some kind of heaven? I'm like, it's so heavenly in Oasis when it's 120. I can't describe to you. But it's a really hard place to live. It is a very hard place to work, and that's what I'm writing about in here. So in any case, um, but to hear stories and then turn them into fiction is much easier than memoir. I'm not going to lie. Memoir is very hard. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm sure you can't chalk me, right? Although you guys are like, we don't want to know anything else. You gave us too much information. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, that's right. You guys can't. When you go around the country and you talk about the stories that are in Mecca uh, or your personal stories, um, what kind of response do you get from, let's say, what's called Middle America? Interestingly, every fall I drive across the whole country with my dog. I mean, I couldn't do it this last fall because um, I couldn't do it during COVID, and I couldn't do it last fall because I am taking care of my mom. But for eight years, I've driven across the country in the fall with my dog. And what's insane is I have these California license plates. I wear, my, I wear my Dodger hat. I got my Dodger shirt. I got my Dodger like, license plate thing. Only in Indiana, that, that's just not me talking. That's just me existing. I have been pulled over three times in Indiana and threatened by state troopers because they hate California. It's, I used to have a USC decal, and they're Notre Dame people, and I think they wanted to kill me, and that was scary. But most of the time, when I am driving, everyone's just like, you know, they want to hear about this, or they want to hear about that. I've never had that level. It's, truthfully, it's academia. It's, when I'm, it's publishing in academia, and they're just, they just, I really believe what I was saying to you. Like, they believe that we are not quite equipped to tell stories that are significantly American. When I go and, and read from Mecca in a place like Lehigh, Pennsylvania, like Bethlehem, people tell me about working in the steel mill, which they find it fascinating that you know my grandfather worked in the steel mill and my grandma was the nurse. If I go to Texas, there's always, you know, we talk about what it's like to grow uh, in my neighborhood. People are fifth generation Mexican American, you know, whereas I'm the first generation. And so there is a fifth generation Texan 
Mexico, Tejano. So we talk about all the differences and the similarities. I have to say the hardest places are, to me, when I go to a fancy event and there's a lot of, you know, I'm reading in front of like a Brooklyn audience. There's just a very, I know you, she's laughing. I, oh, don't, I'm not talking about you. I'm not, I'm not. Okay, I'm saying there is a very Brooklyn and New York thing where people are just like, oh my God, look at you. And I'm not trying to be gross, but I have heard people be like, could you be any more basic? And I'm like, nope, I got my shirt, $8 last night from H&M Clearance. I shop at Marshall's, I have no problem telling you that. And they're just like, why, why would you admit that? And I'm like, because I'm from Riverside, we don't care. And that's, that's the strength, is we literally don't care. We care about who we care about. If there's an earthquake, I'm fine. If there's a revolution, I have eight different men who stop by once a year and say, I'm gonna come get you and the dog first and then we're gonna go get my mom. And I'm like, okay. And these are black men, white men, Chicano men. They're all my men friends. And they're like, you know I got you. And I'm like, yeah, I know, you got me. If there's an earthquake, everyone comes over. They're like, do we need to go, mija? I'm like, I think we're okay. Let's wait for the next one. I can't, I can't replicate that for Brooklyn because I think that's the opposite, but that's an age thing too, darling, isn't it? Like no one wants to be 30 and hear about this deep web of, what's the right word? I'm hungry now. It's connectedness and it's, I mean, it's, responsibility isn't the right word. It is, it's more like a, all of the things. Like yes, obligate, like I am obligated to everyone. When I got my hair cut on, on uh, Tuesday, as I was getting my hair cut by Tracy, we got a phone call that a friend had died, and he had only been sick for three weeks. And he rescued her when her husband like shot himself. She was like, he came and, and got me. And so like we were really sad. I mean, I, had, I cooked that night before I left for his widow. And that's what I mean. That web of obligation, I think, is scary for people in large urban centers. Does, that doesn't answer your question fully, but I think that's a very Riverside thing. And I think that's a California thing, too. So, yeah, it's a good question. Any others? Sorry, I only tell bad stories. They all end in violence. How do your young writing students connect to your um, situatedness and your um, reliance upon storytelling and exchange? And do, do young writers that you're teaching <laughs> get that? I mean, they're, you know, has, has the internet changed it? Like, how are your students with all of this? Well, we are the only UC with a creative writing major. Um, what, do you, what do you all have? Do you have English as creative writing, like, minor? Specialization. Specialization, right? So we have a creative writing major. We have 330 majors, undergrads, and we have 36 graduate students. So again, I've been there since I was 27 years old. Okay, I was a lecturer. We didn't have a department, we had a program. And then when we became a department, it just got bigger and bigger. So I will be honest with you, it, this is not about, this. UCR is famous, as you know, for our, we have huge enrollments of first generation students. So if I have 50 students in a, I, I teach this great seminar, um, writing with multiple languages. I teach one called Family Life in Fiction. I teach one called Road Trip Novel. I teach one called uh, Polyphonic Novel, like Novel in Many Voices. I would say 80% of my students are from California. 80% of them are first generation. So we do the thing I did with you guys. And some of them start crying. They're like, I've never had a professor who said their parents didn't graduate from high school. Or who said like that San Jacinto is important. I got an email this morning from my student um, Natalie Lopez Contreras, and she's from San Jacinto. She's 22. She can't drive. Her parents are from Michoacan. She's not allowed to drive. Her abuelo drives her to UCR, and then he comes back and picks her up. Yeah. So, like, she's working on a fantasy novel about grief, a YA novel. So my students, I'm, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying they, this is what we do. And everyone just wants to see themselves, don't they? 
Like, all of my students are like, I want to write a YA novel that has Latina characters. I want to write a YA fantasy novel that has Korean-American characters. So that's what we do. And part of that class, the, the class that I teach about writing in multiple languages is super popular. And I'll get people from the engineering, from the medical school. Because, for example, I had this great student who was applying. Isaac um, was applying to the medical school. Um, Korean-American, parents born in South Korea. Uh, he was from Orange County. He was from Costa Mesa. So we were like, how do you write in Korean and then write the English translation? So we were using food. Like, everyone's all obsessed with, oh, I love banh mi, right, which is Vietnamese sandwiches. And people were like, so we, I was like, how do you write banh mi if you're writing in Vietnamese and then write banh mi and then get someone to understand it? We talk about context. It's amazing. And that is because, truthfully, because I grew up with a mom who... English was not her first language. That's why I'm so obsessed with language. You know, it's like my character, Johnny Frias, in this book, he's like, the, the, his people come, came on the Anza crossing. That is what I'm writing about. So he's obsessed. He, he grows up, he speaks Spanish until he's five. With my mom, there are still ways that she's learning English at 89, right? So if someone says, like, wild horses couldn't drag me away, like, my mom would be like, what are you, t why would they? Like, they're wild. Why would they want you? How would they drag you? Like you'd have a rope? What is, that? What is going on? What's, what's with the wild horses? Can't you just say horses? And I'm like, no, that, that's not. And like, we, everyone I knew watched Gunsmoke growing up. It didn't matter where your dad was from. You watched Gunsmoke. And people were like, you can bet your Sunday socks that he's going to tie one on. And people would be like, what does that even mean? He's going to tie one on. You're going to get drunk. So I'm just saying I'm obsessed with the language, so it's perfect. It's a great question because what we do is like how, how are you going to write in Spanish, right? And, and how much can you write in Spanish before an American reader is going to be like, this is too hard. And so we end up working on that, right? And so what's the difference between, you know, pendejo and pendejada? Does anybody know? It's bad. I mean, a pendejo is someone stupid, but pendejada is like now everyone's being stupid. So, you know, in my neighborhood, people are like, there's too much pendejada on the block right now. And that means we should all go inside. All right? So if you're going to use that, then you give it context. We have a great time. Um, so many of my students have been published now, and that's also really gratifying. So, yeah, thank you. Other questions? Uh huh. Yeah, uh, uh, fantastic stories. Um, ha in your travels, what is your experience meeting Californians in the diaspora outside California? <laughs> I, I went to Washington, D.C. in the last years of the Reagan administration. I joined the UC Alumni Association in Washington, D.C., which was very interesting to talk to other UC alums about living in what they called the world's most important city, you know, Washington, <laughs> D.C. Of course, we didn't really believe it, but uh, I was wondering what about your experiences seeing Californians in diaspora? This is an excellent question because my kids have lived every, my three daughters have lived everywhere. Like, they're the opposite of me in that, I mean, I, I you know, hang out with people I've known since kindergarten, but my oldest daughter, she is curator of African American history at the Museum of Fredericksburg. So she lives in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And um, she, when I go there, well, one thing is interesting. There, aren't, there, were, there are no Californians in Fredericksburg. In the black community of Fredericksburg, my daughter is revered at age 34. Like she is a queen because she treats the black community in Fredericksburg like our east side, like our, our family. So she has like put all this, she texted me this morning, she has all these signs up now for African American history. Fredericksburg had never acknowledged any African American history. And she's been there, I guess, for two and a half years. But what's really funny is when we go to like Philly or DC, we will meet people from California. And then what's funny is everyone's like, oh, where are you from, right? And then there's that whole, oh, you're from here and you're from here. But either, either they're like, oh my God, I miss California. But now because of the housing prices, it's much more about money, don't you all? Like, people are like, I could never go back to California. Like, how would I ever buy a house? Um, she's the only one, like, she would like to come back, I think. You know, her dream is to work at the Huntington. The middle kid, 
the one that left SBMA. She's lived in Berkeley. She lived for a year in Harlem. She worked for the Met. Everyone made fun of California. She would call me all the time and be like, A, I'm the only person of color at the entire meeting at the Met, and B, people did the whole, I don't know, like, I know LA and I know Palm Springs, and there's like a lot between there, but I've never heard anyone say it was worth anything. And so she'll call me and say, like, this person just dismissed our entire family, like, and everyone we know. And I'm like, yeah, that's what they did. And she's like, aren't you mad? And I'm like, don't care anymore. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to go have tacos. <laughs> but, like, she cared deeply. So when she met someone from California, she was so excited to share, like, stories. Um, whether they were from Oakland or from Studio City, which you're from Studio City. My youngest daughter's dream when she was 12 was to live in Studio City, which I guess she was already 80. She was already your mom. Um, the youngest daughter works in the film industry, and by that I don't mean anything fancy. She works for the TV show Below Deck. Does anybody know Below Deck? People get drunk and have sex on yachts. Um, she's worked there for three years. When she showed it to her dad and me, we were like, is he naked? And she's like, yeah, I had to blur that part. And we're like, oh, th wait, that's what you were doing in the kitchen when you lived with me during COVID? You were blurring people's private parts? And she was like, yeah. You were eating oatmeal, and I was doing that. And I was like, great. That's good to know. Um, so she is in the Seychelles right now. When people find out she's from California, they lose their minds because she is a beautiful black woman in the Seychelles. And everyone in the Seychelles, which is off the coast of Africa, speaks Creole. So everyone speaks to her in French. And she says, Mom, you speak good French. I wish you were here. And I'm like, I could come. Um, all of it is to say is most of it is about money now that people say I could never go back to California. And that's a very Santa Barbara thing I know. Um, people say I could never afford to live there. What's fascinating is like right when I was getting to the end, what I did want to say, because we brought up the internet, it's this, in, I, I wanted to end with the story of the river bottom, but I kept thinking that all the hidden kingdoms from now on are really in, in the brain. Are they not? Like if as life moves more online, and people don't leave their houses, even though COVID has passed but hasn't really passed because Natalie Lopez Contreras emailed me to say her entire family has COVID. And I just had COVID again for the third time in November because I was taking care of my mom and I took her to Kaiser and then she didn't get COVID. She's never had it and I got it for the third time, um, which wasn't fun. People don't want to leave their houses and they don't want to leave the internet, right? So maybe the hidden kingdoms are all inside their brains but the lithium has to come from the Salton Sea, so it's still connected, isn't it? Like, even if the online community is someone's life, but you can't divorce that from the work it takes to make the online community. So I find all that fascinating. Anyway, I don't know if that answered your question, but the California diaspora is definitely about real estate now, don't you think? Yes. And on that note, may I first invite everybody to our reception to have some wine and cheese and continue the conversation. And I have two other announcements. If your students were here with class, you can sign in on the uh, clipboards over here. And since California is about real estate, I urge everybody to come to the Arthur and Group, group Great Debate on February 13th in Campbell Hall. The debate question is, is housing a human right? Mm -hmm. We are going to be exploring the question of housing and and homelessness with a panel of um, experts. So yeah, having, ha having read you that, like, of course, my little mom and my, you know, insane dad, they bought their first house for seven grand, and my in-laws bought their first house for seven grand, and those houses still exist in the family because people are afraid to sell them because of the property taxes, right? But that makes no sense. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, for, thanks for having me.